surprise. He's a man of all seasons. But as you don't know, he's a real Texan. He was born in Austin. <laughs> now, in that regard, we have a special prize for you, Steve. It's inscribed with your name, and it says, born in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Join me in welcoming Steve. Wow. <laughs> OK. Uh, sounds like the microphone is working. Uh, good. So uh, pleasure to be back in my home state. I, uh, I left Austin in 1957 after first grade when the population was 50,000 people. The tallest building was the Scarborough department store at seven stories. And tuition at UTA was $25 a term. So <laughs> things have changed a little bit. OK, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, doing something that sort of doesn't make sense, using very delicate Schrodinger cat states to store quantum information. And uh, experiments are done by my friends uh, here at Yale. The particular idea of using Schrodinger cat states uh, uh, belongs to Maziar Mirahimi, who's uh, a uh, uh, mathematician from Paris and physicist who visits us uh, uh, several months each year. And then, uh, okay, so um, so we'll start with a quiz, but uh, don't worry, I'm going to give you the answers. Uh, so the first question is: Is quantum information carried by waves or particles? Hopefully, you know the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> Is quantum information analog or digital? And it's the same answer. It's analog in the sense that it's digital in the sense that you have discrete energy states. It's, it's analog in the sense that you can have continuously varying superpositions of those states. You can also have continuously developing errors in those states. But if you measure the errors, you get a discrete result, and that discreteness is what allows you to correct errors when they occur, but there are some great subtleties which I'll try to explain. So um, quantum computing is a new paradigm for understanding that's a result of advances in our understanding of the information content of quantum systems. It's a new way to store, process, uh, in, and communicate information. It uses superposition, so quantum bits can be in superpositions of 0 and 1, which in some very rough and not, not really accurate sense, uh, you can be both 0 and 1 at the same time, which gives you a kind of quantum parallelism. You can do exponentially uh, many things at the same time because the Schrodinger equation is linear and will operate on superpositions. Uh, but then uh, part of the power of a quantum computer comes from entanglement, from uh, spooky non-classical correlations that bits can have uh, uh, inside your quantum computer, something that Einstein was very uncomfortable with and pointed out and, and uh, uh, did us a great service because he, he was uncomfortable with this because he understood the implications of quantum mechanics much better than uh, his contemporaries. And uh, one of the reasons it's important is that a kind of routine engineering test that you tune up the computer every morning before you start experiments is you violate the Bell inequalities that uh, Einstein, uh, these kind of spooky entanglement operations that Einstein thought um, were impossible. And if you're doing something that Einstein said was impossible, then your computer is quantum and not classical. So uh, a register of n conventional bits can be in one of two to the n states. Here's binary numbers representing 0 through 7, so 2 to the 3. And of course, a register of quantum bits can be in a superposition of an exponentially many uh, states. Uh, and there are many, many, there are exponentially many such superpositions, not all orthogonal, but 
uh, very different. And uh, this is part of the power of the quantum computer. So the Hilbert space of even a quantum computer with 50 or 100 qubits is so gigantic that it would be um, uh, essentially impossible to simulate its operation, you know, mathematically calculate how well it's going to work and so forth on a classical computer because the Hilbert space is just too large. So you don't need a millions of qubits in a quantum computer before, uh, even if you had 50 or 100, uh, you would have something that um, would be extremely powerful and uh, approaching the limits of what you could do with a classical computer. So we don't, uh, just as the people who invented the laser didn't know uh, what it would be good for, that you could transmit music and so forth, do eye surgery. Um, we don't completely know what a uh, quantum computer could be good for if we could build one, but one thing for sure it'll be good at is solving the equations of quantum mechanics, even including the ones with the minus signs from fermions. So one application will be doing quantum chemistry and condensed matter physics electronic structure calculations. Uh, and uh, already there are um, published experiments on uh, very small quantum computers doing extremely crude quantum chemistry calculations, which will get uh, exponentially better in the next few years, we think. So storing and manipulating quantum inf information in quantum states sounds like it might be something interesting, but how, how do you actually do this? How do you build uh, a quantum computer, and there are many different technologies and based on trapped ions and NV centers and diamond, and, and I'm going to tell you about um, building artificial atoms out of superconducting electrical circuits. So here's a uh, Bohr model of a real atom, say hydrogen, uh, not to scale, and it has quantized energy levels, and you could call the lowest one zero and the next one one, and that, that could be your uh, quantum bit. Uh, if you have a superconducting uh, electrical circuit, let's say, um, okay, let's say a, uh, what happened to my animation? Uh, it's not going to animate, let's see. There he goes. Okay. Uh, so uh, charge, if it's a superconductor and there's nominally no friction, the charges can flow back and forth in this LC oscillator, which contains around a trillion electrons. So you might think if you had a molecule that had a trillion electrons, um, it would have a pretty complicated spectrum. It would be hard to understand. Uh, but this artificial atom, even though it's macroscopic and contains trillions of electrons, will turn out to have a very simple uh, spectrum. Uh, these things are uh, basically superconducting circuits uh, constructed on an insulating substrate like silicon or sapphire by electron and optical beam lithography, much the way you make ordinary computer chips out of semiconductors instead of superconductors. So uh, that suggests that perhaps this is a scalable technology. You could make thousands of these. Whether you can control them is, a, a, is the thing that has to be uh, solved. So the sort of transistor of this type of system is the Josephson junction. It's a, uh, a tunnel junction, a thin layer, nanometer thick layer of aluminum oxide separating two pieces of aluminum, which are uh, superconducting. And uh, in a superconductor, the electrons travel around in Cooper pairs, and they can tunnel coherently through this insulating barrier. And, uh, and, and the charge excitations that result from the currents flowing back and forth, that's the excited states of our artificial atom. And unlike the LC oscillator that I showed you previously, the Josephson junction acts like a nonlinear inductor, an inductance whose value depends on the current flowing. So it makes a, an anharmonic, uh, unequally spaced set of quantum levels 
and so it's more, you know, more like an atom. And I can control the transitions uh, separately and independently. So here's a, a, a micrograph of what, what we call a transmon qubit. It's a small uh, aluminum antenna, about a millimeter long, and the two halves of the antenna are connected by this Josen junction, which is like a nonlinear um, inductor. And the excitations are Cooper pairs flowing back and forth like this, producing dipole charge oscillations. As I said, there's about a trillion mobile electrons, and yet this thing turns out to be have a very simple quantized energy spectrum, despite the fact that it's large enough to see with your naked eye, at least if you're young, and uh, despite the fact that it has a trillion electrons. And the reason is that superconductivity um, pairs the electrons together, and it takes a very large energy to break them apart, and uh, produce, they kind of all condense into one state and are sloshing back and forth uh, together. So all the single particle degrees of freedom have disappeared, and it acts like one particle moving back and forth in a cosine potential, making an enharmonic oscillator. So the energy quantized energy level spectrum is simpler than hydrogen. There's no fine structure. There's no hyperfine structure. It's just this enharmonic oscillator, and the uh, spontaneous emission lifetime of the excited state, T1, uh, here uh, hydrogen emits a, a three quarters of a Rydberg uh, uh, ultraviolet photon when the 2p state decays. Here you emit a five gigahertz microwave photon. Uh, that lifetime multiplied by the frequency of the transition gives you a kind of quality factor, Q, for the oscillator, and it's comparable for this object and for hydrogen. So, uh, and then of course, atomic physicists will notice that this is much larger than their atoms. It's a millimeter in size. The transition dipole moment is several Cooper pairs of electrons sloshing back and forth a millimeter. The zero-point fluctuations of the charge on this capacitor is, is several electron pairs. So that tremendous transition dipole moment means that we can engineer extremely strong coupling between the atoms and microwave photons. And if the coupling's not strong enough, we can just make the antenna longer. These are all um, handmade, uh, bespoke uh, atoms. That can be engineered. So this this idea of having uh, uh, maybe putting this in a cavity or a resonator, like in cavity QED um, uh, here, but here with electrical circuits uh, uh, and artificial atoms, we we refer to this as circuit quantum electrodynamics. So the first electronic quantum computer was built using this technology by my friends here in 2009. It had only two quantum bits uh, interacting with each other via virtual microwave photon exchange inside this cavity. Uh, it's very small, but you could still execute some simple quantum algorithms and do things that uh, are not possible even on a, a classical uh, computer. But still, can't, you know, very primitive. So, uh, so the good news is you have this huge information content in the giant Hilbert space of a quantum system. The bad news is it comes with a price that that quantum, the strength of a quantum system is also its uh, Achilles heel. It, it's very, very. They tend to be very, very sensitive to noise perturbations, uh, accidental observation, uh, entanglement with their environment. And um, so you can't, you, 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 you cannot look at the quantum computer while it's operating or you will collapse its state and it will fail. Uh, but just, uh, so the, the, the thing that fails is the phase of the quantum superpositions of the qubits. Uh, and that is well defined only for some coherence time, T2 in NMR language. 
Uh, but despite this great sensitivity through the fact that we can engineer these artificial atoms, change the design, put them into cavities to protect them from spontaneous emission, that, that gives you a factor of a thousand right there, um, we've been able to make uh, exponential progress in the coherence times uh, of these individual qubits. So this is the same data, this is sort of a Yale plot, this is an MIT plot, and you can see that the first superconducting qubit built in 1998 had a immeasurably small coherence time around uh, a nanosecond. And uh, now we've reached a uh, uh, millisecond coherence time. So six orders of magnitude in, in 20 years. So that's pretty good. Uh, and this, this exponential growth in coherence time uh, may well continue. It's, you know, past performance is no guarantee of future returns. But uh, even if it does, we're still stuck with an uh, important law of physics, which uh, I modestly call Gervin's law, which is that there's no such thing as too much coherence. If you have one second of coherence time, somebody will come and say, yes, but I have a problem I want to run in your quantum computer, and it's going to take 10 seconds. So please make the coherence time longer. So as a result of the fact that coherence is a resource and, and uh, we can always use more of it, even uh, if this the technical progress in coherence times continues, we'd like to have quantum error correction because we're going to try to scale up to many quantum bits that are imperfect and we want to build a nearly perfect quantum computer out of these imperfect parts. So. Uh, how do we how do we do that? And so the quantum error correction problem is, I think, quite interesting. And the fact that you can do quantum error correction, to me, is much more amazing than the fact that you could do quantum computing itself with with if you had perfect parts. So in a nutshell, the problem is the following. I'm going to give you an unknown quantum state, a superposition of zero and one with some some uh, coefficients, psi zero and psi one, or some orientation of this fake spin a half on the block sphere. And uh, I'm not going to tell you uh, what it is. And of course, you can't measure it, because that would change it uh, and, and, and collapse the state. So there's no way to directly measure it to see if it has an error. Besides, you don't know what it is. And uh, your job is, if it does de this unknown state does develop an error, please fix it. So that's actually, uh, you know, at first sight seems impossible, but miraculously, uh, it actually can be done. So I'm going to try to explain um, how it can be done. So uh, quantum error correction for an unknown state requires you to take you have a toolbox and you have n physical qubits of some kind, maybe the transmons that I just showed you. And you want to take a collection of them and you want to store a, your quantum information, your superposition of uh, 0 and 1 uh, in some non-local way where the information is spread out in non-classical correlations and entanglement among these n qubits. And it has to be, sorry? Uh, uh, you will have to make uh, special quantum states where, yes, there is coherence between them, entanglement. Um, and it has to be this way because if any single uh, physical qubit knows what the what the quantum information is that you're trying to store, that's a disaster because the environment could come in and measure that and learn something about the quantum state that you're trying to store and change it by uh, by the act of looking at it. So the act of looking an error on any one of these or the environment measuring any one of those cannot give the environment any information about the state that the unknown state that you were asked to store there. So that's kind of strange. And uh, so we need to build a Maxwell demon, also out of imperfect parts, unfortunately. 
and it has to figure out a way to make measurements here which do not tell it what the quantum information is that's being stored, but does tell it what error occurred. And then it has to actuate a controller, uh, change the state to get rid of that error by pumping the entropy into some cold bath. So you're continuously trying to cool this logical qubit, this collection of physical qubits, in a way that removes the errors but uh, doesn't do anything to the information that you're trying to store there. Well, right away you have a problem because uh, each of these guys has a lifetime of a millisecond, let's say, and uh, I want to, uh, the first thing that happens is, let's say I have nine of them, now the error rate is nine times faster. So I've, I've made the problem nine times worse, okay? And so my Maxwell demon is going to be, have to be so efficient and so accurate and get rid of errors so quickly that it has to overcome that factor of nine just to break even, just to get back to where you started. And really, it's not worth doing all that unless you can then make the lifetime much longer. So, um, and again, it's made out of imperfect parts, so uh, that's a challenge. So, uh, one of the dirty secrets in the literature is there are all kinds of experiments uh, published in fancy journals about running quantum error correction protocols, but none of them ever advertised the fact that, that they all made the problem worse instead of better, that none of them reached the break-even point. Okay? So um, uh, I'm going to tell you about an experiment that, for the first time in, in any technology, uh, atomic and solid state and so forth, actually does make things better. So the current um, industrial approach from uh, the big, uh, big companies is to try to make very large logical qubits, these so-called um, surface codes, which are have certain topological properties that will allow them to protect quantum information uh, by scaling up to very large sizes and then learning how to control these things extremely well, you might be able to reach the break-even point. So they, uh, you've seen lots of press releases where, you know, uh, Google is working on 72 qubit thing, IBM is working on 50. So that co working on is a code for it's not working yet, otherwise they would be talking about that. So here's uh, some large number of uh, qubits, they're all coupled together. Uh, not shown are all the control wires that you need to um, put the qubits in, in, in certain entangled states to measure various four spin correlators in there to look for errors. Very complicated uh, system. And um, it's, it, it's, uh, it's just going to be extremely challenging, although, and there are some sort of simulations on classical computers that suggest maybe at the 50 qubit scale, if people can make technological progress over where they are now, you could reach the break even point. But it's going to be very uh, complex. And we feel we can criticize this approach since we. Uh, uh, you know, invented this type of uh, qubit, and since all the people at these companies, almost all of them were <laughs> our graduates of our group. Uh, but they're images of what we were doing 10 years ago, and we think we have a better idea uh, now. So rather than um, uh, scaling up, trying to figure out how to control this thing, and then learn how to do error correction, we want to do error correction first on very simple hardware and then scale up the number of qubits, logical qubits, that we have uh, from there. So I'm going to, um, so we're going to uh, do something strange. We're not going to use material qubits. They're going to be uh, microwave photon states stored in empty boxes, in, in vacuum, surrounded by mirrors, essentially, by superconducting walls of uh, aluminum. And the thing that, uh, this transmon qubit that we invented that everybody's using, instead of being the qubit in our system, is just going to be an ancilla. It's going to be a nonlinear oscillator, which will grant us 
the control needed to make complicated microwave photon states, which is where the quantum information is going to be living. So it's an extremely simple modular system. Uh, it's a sort of cubic centimeter of vacuum surrounded by uh, aluminum, and there's some microwave mode in the gigahertz range that lives there. And it'll be in some state that's a superposition of 0 and 2 and 4 and 6 and 8 photons that we can control. There'll be this uh, uh, ancilla nonlinear oscillator to allow us to make those superpositions. Another little resonator that allow us to read out the state of this uh, ancilla so that we can do state tomography. And instead of hundreds and hundreds of wires coming out, there's one wire. And that one wire, depending on the frequency you use, can control this resonator or that resonator or this ancilla uh, to carry out different tasks. As a very, it's very, very hardware efficient. It's got hardly any moving parts, uh, just a single output wire. You can do comp we have a scheme for doing complete state tomography of these complicated uh, logical states of our, our photons. Uh, so it's extremely um, efficient, and uh, as I'll show you, it actually works. So, so the reason we like to use cavities is that you can make high-Q cavities that have longer lifetimes than the things that other people are using as the qubits. It has a larger Hilbert space. There's a state 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, so you can use that to replace several physical uh, qubits. It has a very uh, low rate of errors because of the long lifetime, and the error model is very simple. It uh, occasionally loses a photon. A photon either leaks out or gets eaten up by some dirt on the surface of the superconductor. But that's about the only error, at least it's the dominant error. Another kind of error you could have would be dephasing, where the frequency of the cavity wandered around. But the frequency of the cavity is determined by its geometry, and that's sitting still at uh, 10 millikelvin and not fluctuating. As a, uh, and then I've mentioned that it has simple ways of reading out the states of the entire system with very few components. OK, so in order to make this work, we're going to have to figure out a way to put some novel photon states in the cavity. Those are going to be our states of our logical qubits. So we need a logical 0 and a logical 1. And they're going to be superpositions of 0, 2, 4, 6, 8 photons. And they're going to be two different ones that are orthogonal to each other. And the quantum information is in the amplitudes by which those two code words are, have, are sitting in the superposition. Just like uh, ground state and excited state of an atom uh, with some coefficients, that's a quantum bit of information. This is like that, but with more complicated states, namely these photon states, um, to uh, represent the states of our logical qubit. And uh, the pre as I mentioned, the presence of this nonlinear ancilla will allow us to make, give us a universal control over the states of this oscillator. OK, so let's remind ourselves about uh, states of harmonic oscillators. So uh, that electromagnetic cavity, if you had a lumped element version of it, it would be an LC oscillator. Uh, the coordinate can be chosen to be the flux, the, mag the magnetic field, and the Momentum is the electric field or the charge on the capacitor plates. So I'll use first quantization to describe photons, something you may not be used to. Uh, so there's a wave function as a function of the coordinate, which is, for a harmonic oscillator, just a Gaussian. right? And this is the vacuum state with uh, no photons. It has some zero-point uncertainty in the coordinate or the, the, the vacuum fluctuations of the magnetic field. The first excited state has one photon in it. It's just the coordinate times the Gaussian. The wave function looks like that. The square of the wave function tells me the probability that there's a given uh, flux through the coil. So 
one, the only, if you don't have a nonlinear oscillator as an ancilla, there's only one thing you can do. You can apply classical drive from your commercial microwave generator, which is like, or, uh, like a laser, except it doesn't have any noise, and it's um, <laughs> much easier to operate. The only thing it'll do is you can displace the oscillator. You can take the zero point, uh, you know, ground state wave function and just move it a distance alpha measured in units of square root of photon number. And um, that's called a coherent state, and it will just, you know, begin to oscillate like this. And that's, that's as close to the classical signal coming out of a radio station as anything. So that's the only thing you can make if you don't have this nonlinear ancilla available to help you make more complicated states. And in this state, uh, once you displace it, it's oscillating. It's not a stationary state. It's a superposition of energy eigenstates with a Poisson distribution of uh, photon number. You can also, uh, instead of displacing the oscillator in space, you can just give it a kick, displace it in momentum, uh, or some combination of the two. So we're I'm going to show you a lot of phase space pictures. This is the coordinate. This is the momentum. And classically, there would be a sharp point that tells you where you are. Quantum mechanically, there's a fuzzy blob there because of the uncertainty principle between position and uh, momentum. So there's some amplitude and some phase. And uh, harmonic oscillators, of course, just move around in circles. Uh, uh, that's their natural dynamics. And uh, this one is moving around five or six billion times per second. So all the pictures I will show you will be in some frame rotating with that so it looks like it's sitting still. Okay, so uh, here's an experimental measurement of the Poisson distribution of the photon number in the cavity containing a coherent state. How did we measure that? Well, uh, let's look at the Hamiltonian. There's a harmonic oscillator for the cavity with some frequency omega c, the photon number. We're going to approximate uh, a, uh, the ancilla as a two-level system coupled to that. And uh, the dipole coupling will we'll, uh, remove a photon from the cavity, put the excitation in the qubit, and it'll go back and forth. If they're detuned from each other, then uh, you can't conserve energy doing that. So the photon goes, excites the atom and then quickly de-excites it. And in second-order perturbation theory, you get this so-called dispersive coupling between them uh, in which uh, you have some number, chi, the dispersive coupling, Sigma z, which measures whether you're in the ground state or excited state of the atom. And then a dagger a is the photon number. So this term uh, changes the frequency of the cavity depending on the state of the qubit and changes the frequency of the qubit depending on the number of photons in the cavity. So each photon that I add sh causes a light shift. Well, no, it's not resonant. They're detuned uh, 20 percent or something. Very, very important. Yeah. Uh, so the so this dress this is conserved and that's separately conserved, right? So each photon that you add to the cavity shifts the frequency of the atom by 3,000 linewidths. So it's a a dispersive coupling that atomic physicists would kill for, and have threatened to kill us for. Uh, so uh, uh, you, you can easily do spec quantum jump spectroscopy on the qubit. You apply a tone and see whether it jumped into the excited state. And you can find out if it jumped into the excited state because the cavity frequency will change. Uh, so here you see uh, the energy of the atom when you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 photons in the cavity. I told you they were split by 3,000 line widths. It doesn't look like that. That's because the graduate students were in a hurry and, and uh, power broadened the spectrum by a factor uh, of 100. So uh, one thing you should learn from this is that microwaves, despite their name, are particles. They're photons. They're quanta. They have 100,000 times less energy than visible photons, but they're still uh, discrete. And uh, we have a funny proposal for 
for using for uh, using this to uh, do certain types of dark matter searches where the dark matter particles turn into microwave photons. Okay, so now uh, uh, I've sh shown you what kind of, uh, at least what a coherent state in the cavity looks like. Uh, paradoxically, we're going to use very, very delicate photon cat states as a long-lived storage for quantum information. So that seems crazy, but I'll explain how it works. So a Schrodinger cat state is a superposition of, of a coherent state with this amplitude and a coherent state with that amplitude. It's a, it's a, you know, displacing the oscillator in two directions at once, if you will. And the wave function could look like this, in which case you have a, a plus sign alpha plus minus alpha. Uh, this is a even parity function. It's only made of 0, 2, 4, 6, 8 photons. Or you could have a minus sign here, and the wave function would look like that. And um, that's only made out of 1, 3, 5, 7, 9 uh, photons. So this is a superposition of two different macroscopic states, or mesoscopic states, depending on how big this is. And um, I won't, uh, it's through this same uh, dispersive Hamiltonian with the, this strong dispersive coupling, several thousand line widths, you can easily make such objects. But I, I don't have time to uh, go through the details of how we do that. But here's some, uh, some data showing uh, that indeed even cats have even parity and odd cats have odd parity. So here's a coherent state, the spectrum of a qubit the probability of finding different photon numbers for a coherent state, here's for an even cat, and here's for an odd cat. So the fact that the amplitude for uh, finding an even number of photons in an odd cat is very small is the result of destructive interference. So this, this sign has to be well-defined, that it's not a mixture of alpha and minus alpha. That would give you this. Uh, it's, uh, it's a coherent superposition that either kills off these numbers or kills off those numbers, okay? So it really is a uh, coherent, macroscopic coherent superposition. And we've made them up to 111 photons, which is perhaps among the most, the largest, you know, the most macroscopic superpositions uh, uh, ever created. So the sort of key enabling technology, if we're going to use these cat states to hold quantum information uh, and detect errors, is an ability to measure the photon number parity without measuring the photon number. So I showed you we could measure photon numbers. One way to measure the parity is to measure that it's 7 and have a lookup table that says, oh, 7 is odd, so the parity is odd. Uh, but that's very bad because you learned much more than the parity. You learned that the number was 7, and so the state has collapsed from a cat to a fox state of 7. That's way too much back action. But if you can erase the information about the number and only keep whether the number is even or odd, uh, you, can, uh, you can really make powerful use of these cat states, which I will uh, now explain. And the, again, I won't... Uh, I won't explain how it is that we can measure, erase the number information and just measure the parity. Uh, I can, somebody can ask me afterwards if they want, but it's 99.8% quantum non-demolition. We can repeat it hundreds of times without doing damage to the, to the state. And one of the really powerful features of being able to measure the parity is that you can do complete state tomography uh, by measuring something called the Wigner function of the, the cavity. It's a uh, form of the density matrix. So here's a picture doing state tomography on one of these cats by measuring the Wigner function. And here you see this is phase space, this is position, this is momentum. I've displaced the, ca the cavity this way and that way. This blob here, let's see. Uh, this blob here corresponds to minus alpha. 
Um, this blob here corresponds to plus alpha. Then you see uh, there's some fuzziness to it. That's the vacuum noise. That's the uncertainty principle that I can't measure position and momentum uh, perfectly. And so that's, you know, um, uh, vacuum noise. And I, when I give this talk to atomic people, I have to point out, yes, this is data, not simulation. And um, these interference fringes uh, prove that it's a coherent superposition, not a mixture of alpha and minus alpha. And the fact that the central fringe is red, the same color as those guys, tells me that it's an even cat. An odd cat has opposite colored fringes. So what is this? It's, it's uh, yeah. So the Wigner function uh, involves a Fourier transform of part of the uh, density matrix. And this is literally the two-slit diffraction pattern from those two blobs. It's literally what it is, turned uh, 90 degrees. Uh, OK, so all right, so uh, well, now how do we use these Schrodinger cats so we can me we produce them, we can measure them? How do we use them to store quantum information? So we need two logical code words, one to represent logical zero of the bit and one to represent logical one, and they have to be orthogonal. So we're going to use two even parity cats. One is the cat I already told you about, which is uh, position alpha and minus alpha. The other is a cat that's displaced in momentum rather than position. And if you think of alpha as the amplitude in the complex plane, then this is I alpha plus minus I alpha. Okay? But they both have a plus sign. They're both even parity. Okay? So they are eigenstates. And if I make any superposition of these two code words, no matter what it is, it's an eigenstate of the parity operator with eigenvalue plus 1. And that's going to be um, very important. So uh, there's a magic property of coherent states that when I remember the dominant error is losing a photon. And when I lose a photon, in a coherent state, I'm in the same state. If that doesn't bother you, I'll wait a little longer. No, I don't well, it's true. It's the, it's, uh, it's the Hilbert Hotel. Every, every uh, n moves down to n minus 1, and uh, you're in the same. Uh, but the parity has changed, thank you. But it, uh, uh, it doesn't have definite parity, but if you had a cat state that was an even parity state, then it becomes an odd parity state. There is a phase that comes with it, alpha. So if, uh, but that's an extremely simple change. Alpha plus minus alpha just becomes alpha minus minus alpha. So if I can keep track of the parity jumps, I can... I know exactly what state I am in, and there's no more decoherence. The, the delicacy of a uh, Schrodinger cat state is because it loses photons, and you lose track. You if you're not monitoring how many you've lost, you have no idea. Um, uh, well, so yeah. So um, how you know? We all know that damped oscillators lose energy. And surely they lose energy by emitting photons into the bath. Well, that's not true because they're, uh, they stay in the same state. The way they lose energy is not by these quantum jumps. It's by what happens when there's no jump. So you're sitting outside with a detector and it's clicking, photons are coming out. That's not why the, the state is losing energy. It's the no-jump events when the dog does not bark in the night that uh, forces you to make a Bayesian update. I didn't see any clicks, so maybe there were fewer photons than I thought. And there's a, there, that's where the amplitude damping is. Uh, it turns out that that's completely deterministic. This is random, these jumps. But that's deterministic, and uh, we take that into account in software. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, if you lose a photon from a cat state, it just flips the parity, doesn't do anything else, and that's the thing we can measure with 99.8% uh, fidelity and QND-ness. So if we can measure the parity very frequently, we know exactly what's happening to the states, and uh, basically it's just like a basis change. You, you, you know there's no uh, decoherence. Okay, so for example, so an even state, even cat turns to an odd cat, uh, if, it, if you lose two photons, you come back to the original state, so the zero logical goes to this error word, and then you lose one more, and it's back to zero logical. The other one uh, even goes to odd, but a factor of i comes out. If you do that twice, it comes back to being even, but there's a minus sign, so there's a, there's a phase flip. But if you do it four times, then any superposition of your two code words comes back to what it was before. And in between, yeah, yes, the states have changed, but we know exactly how. So if you tell me how many parity jumps, which is a photon loss, there were, mod 4, uh, then I know exactly what, the, what state I'm in, and uh, there's, no, there's no decoherence. I can read it out. And so I can successfully read out these. Uh, I still have preserved these coefficients, which are my quantum information. OK, so we can recover the state. And we don't have to do anything as the errors are happening. We just have to count them. Some error correction protocols require you to fix stuff you know, right, right there when they happen. OK, so here is uh, the Maxwell demon. Uh, for the first one that actually made things better. So it's some high-speed uh, computer cards. It sends microwave pulses down to the bottom of this doer where the quantum computer sits. They bounce back, carrying information about the parity. It measures the parity. It makes a decision about what kind of pulse to send next and turns it around and sends it again. The latency time is about 200 nanoseconds. 15% of that is the speed of light time from here down to the bottom of the doer and back. So this is a very, very fast uh, processor. And you need, you, know, you need to measure the parity and make decisions very, very quickly. Because uh, one source of error, if you didn't measure the parity frequently, there might be two jumps in between the time you looked. And you would think, oh, the parity hasn't changed, so there were zero jumps. But actually, there were two jumps of the parity. So uh, I won't attempt to explain this uh, thing, but the, the, it's the sort of flow process inside the processor. And you can stop it after so many steps and do a full uh, state tomography of the system to debug it and so forth. And uh, it makes branches depending on what errors it detects. And then it uh, uh, recovers the state of the system at the end. So uh, in, there's lots of interesting things in there, but I'll skip all the details just to impress you that it's complicated. So, all right, so first thing we do is we want to uh, put the quantum information into this ancilla transmon a superposition of the ground state and the excited state with some amplitude and phase, and then see if it's still there later. And we find that the phase of that superposition uh, gets lost on a, exponentially on a time scale of about 15 microseconds. So very, it's a particularly poor uh, ancilla. We, today, we could do it with um, 100 or 150 microseconds. Um, because uh, we've figured out how to make them better. So that's, uh, uh, that's one time scale just using the ancilla, the thing that other people are using as the qubit. So now, whoa. Uh, OK, sorry. So this is what happens if you transfer the information from that ancilla into the cavity not using the cat code, but just using for the two states, zero photon and one photon. Why is that interesting? Because that's the code that has the least number of photons. 
And the rate at which you lose photons is proportional to how many you have. So this is the longest lived uh, thing. And it, and it lives 290 microseconds, so 20 times longer. That's not quantum error correction. That's just using a better, picking a better qubit out of your toolbox and using it, OK? But this is the thing we have to beat in order to say we reached break even. So now we're going. Uh, yeah, the, yes, exact. So the, I'm going to put in, uh, transfer the information into a cat state now, a small cat like this, but not do the quantum error correction, not do the parity measurements. And the lifetime gets worse. So that's the analog of that factor of 9 or n in, the, in, in making n things, uh, the, each of which has errors. There are more photons in this state. There are uh, roughly t uh, twice as many, two and a half times as many. And so the error rate is faster, and the decay time has gotten worse. So now we have to turn on the error correction, the parity measurements, and see if we can get it back to here. That's reaching break even. So we turn on the error correction protocol, and it gets slightly better than, uh, than break even. And it's the first time in any technology ion traps or anything else uh, in which you actually uh, made things better. So that's, uh, we're pretty happy about that. It turns out that this system has an interesting property that it heralds, wh when the Maxwell demon makes a mistake, uh, uh, it, it heralds the error by, at the end of the protocol, the cavity gets left with a crazy bunch of photons in it, and you can measure that. So if we, that happens about 20% of the time in this particular configuration. If we throw out those uh, runs, if we post-select only the ones where that didn't happen, uh, so keep 80% of the data, then it jumps up to 560 microseconds, uh, uh, so substantially better than break-even. Of course, it's slightly cheating to post-select, but it's not completely cheating because it turns out that if you have a system that heralds errors like that, then there are very simple protocols that take multiple copies of those things and uh, does a uh, and ignores the the ones that uh, stick their hand up and say I don't feel well, uh, and and so uh, this is actually uh, uh, the fact that the errors are heralded is is a good sign, and uh, so we using that we're we're substantially past um, the break even point. So, so we've managed to uh, figure out how to keep the cats uh, dead and alive for longer uh, with this uh, protocol. And uh, it's the um, uh, sort of milestone in, in quantum error correction that hopefully will lead to experiments where we can go 10 and 100 times past break even and really make very long lived qubits. Uh, other experiments that we've done involve, it's not just a quantum memory, but it's a, it's a logical qubit. You can uh, 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 rotate this logical qubit on the logical block sphere. You can change an x eigenstate to a minus x or a z to a minus z or y to minus y and so forth. Uh, we've also done uh, two qubit controlled not lot between logical operations. We've entangled two logical qubits and violated uh, Bell inequality by nine standard deviations and so forth. So um, we think it's the beginning of the era of um, uh, quantum error correction and operations on uh, logically encoded qubits. So uh, there are the references, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Uh, so we have two cavities, and they have different uh, photon code words in them, and they're connected by one of these ancillas. And um, 
all of the operations are done by applying drive tones to the cavities and to the ancilla all at the same time. And uh, they're just numerically optimized. Uh, and we keep yelling at the students, yeah, but tell us how they work. And they say, we don't care, they work. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bit hard to explain. But, but you can put the ancilla in a certain state um, if this cavity is in a certain state, and then change this cavity if that ancilla is in that state. That's roughly how it, <laughs> roughly how it works. Ba you know, uh, but I can't give you a simple story about you know they have a certain interaction and that you know that we use to uh, to do the control knot. We it's some complex numerically optimized pulse sequence that I can't explain. <laughs> Number 30. Before you were discussing the properties of coherent states. Yeah. Is that 30? Where are we? There we go. So we know that if you have a cavity and you put a dissipated mechanism on the cavity, starting in a coherent state, later in time I go to a coherent state with diminished amplitude. Yes. So this is different because it's unitary, or how do you? Oh, it? so so uh, I, in an effort to not run over time, I removed that very slide last night. Uh, but the so so these cats right now in the protocol, you make them, and during over time they actually shrink. But it's completely deterministic, and so when we go to read them out, alpha, alpha changes. But that's all. It's just uh, the size of alpha changes. Uh, we just take that into account in the software when we decode it. Michel Deberet, my one of my experimental colleagues, is has um, done um, parametric, let's see, a down conversion, so so um, two photon pumping, which will keep this uh, state alpha and minus alpha alive indefinitely, in the presence of dissipate. Uh, uh, dissipation, uh, but in order to use this code, he needs to be able to pump four photons at a time to keep this cat and that cat uh, alive, and that's a bigger technical challenge, but it's, it's something that it's working on. Also, since we do, in principle, have universal control over these things, we can stop and, and send in pulses that keep inflating the cats to, uh, to overcome that. Uh, damping, but it, it was not done in this uh, experiment. And it, it's fine until the two blobs get so close together they're not orthogonal anymore. Uh, so uh, you might be used to optical cavities that are 100,000 wavelengths long and the modes are the zillions of modes. These cavities are uh, half a wavelength in size, or one wavelength, so the modes are very, very far apart. And it, you just pick a frequency, and it, it's very totally obvious, yeah. The modes are separated by a factor of two in frequency, so. So there's modes and thousands, is there eigenmodes then? Oh, sorry. So, there's, so let's distinguish modes and the photons. So the mode is, you know, some number of half wavelengths that fit inside the cavity and determine the frequency. And then that mode can contain 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7 photons. And the thing we measure is um, the, the parity of that number. And the way we do it is the same dispersive coupling. You, you put the ancilla in a superposition of ground and excited. And then the light shift changes the frequency that it processes at. So if there are no photons, let's say it sits here. If there's one, we let it process this far. If there's two photons, it processes twice as fast and goes here. Three, four, five, six. So you just entangle the parity with the X component of the ancilla, and it erases. You, can't, you don't know how many times it went around, so it erases the number, keeps only the parity. Yeah. 
Yep. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and it works like a charm. Yep. Yeah, but what about another type of uh, decoherence, like noise? Right. So there could be displacement noise. You know, the. Right. Uh, For example, the flip of a nuclear spin or something like that. Um, well, for the photons, they're really the only things that can happen are you could accidentally add a photon, which ch also changes the parity, but also, um, you know, there's a, a phase jump like in shallow towns, I guess, and uh, or you could have the cavity dimensions change and the frequency would shift and change the phase. That that's, pro you know, that may happen. Uh, but it, it's uh, so far we haven't observed it. The ca cavities are just extremely stable. The dominant thing is the is the photon loss. So we're taking advantage of that. You know, the only errors you have to correct are the ones you have. And so it's actually an advantage to have a very asymmetric error model with, with only one type of thing happening. But to continue with that point for a second, my earlier point, it's only with pure dissipation, pure yep. absorption, that I am able to achieve what I want. That's right. I have just a little bit of gain, then I have spontaneous emission. That's right. And I'm out of business. Uh, not completely, because uh, there's another, where's the references here? Um, this paper here invents some codes of small numbers of superpositions of photons that are sort of simplified versions of this. But you, if you tell me I want to protect against loss up to, up to losing up to two photons, gaining up to three, uh, some dephasing, uh, there's a member of this family of codes that will protect or can recover from that. Uh, the, the, this this one can't, but others can. Right. So I think the que your question you're asking is: Suppose I have many qubits. Uh, what is the error model? So the simplest error model is that each one has independently some kinds of errors, and they can be independently corrected. But what if there are correlated errors uh, between the qubits? So we haven't seen any evidence for such correlated errors. So that's uh, actually important. Uh, uh, it'll be um, it, it adds in a complication if they're correlated, although you can invent what are called decoherence-free subspaces that uh, protect you against perfectly correlated errors. The one way that you do get correlated errors is you have to do two and higher qubit gates to operate the computer, and the actuator that carries out the gates is not perfect and makes mistakes and it can make correlated errors in the two qubits that are the subject to the, to the two qubit gate you're trying to do. Um, and uh, so that's uh, getting into the realm of what's called not error correction, but fault tolerance. You, you want to uh, start to really think seriously about a whole system that's making different kind of errors because it's made of imperfect parts. And can you find a way to make those errors uh, stay within your control space where you can get rid of them? And um, it, so you're raising uh, an important question. People, we have ideas for how to make uh, what are called error transparent gates, where you, the error might happen during the gate, and you can fix it afterwards, and the gate will still have worked correctly. Uh, but this is, an, this is a challenge and an open area of uh, research, and we don't know for sure uh, what kind of errors we'll have when we have a very large collection of these that are all operating. What's the technology? 
technology landscape. You've got the Serac Zaro irons in a trap and yeah. other ways people think might work. How do, how do you uh, assess? So I would say, you know, I mean, in the year 2000, there was some kind of national roadmap for quantum computing and superconducting qubits were not on it, uh, not even mentioned. So um, uh, it's difficult to predict the future, but I would say ion traps and superconducting qubits are the two things that are attracting the most commercial interest because they're the further, fur considerably further ahead than the other technologies. There's Rydberg atoms, there's cold atom uh, in lattices, um, there are defect centers in diamond and silicon carbide and other things. There's um, Majorana fermions in topological superconductors, where, which is the Microsoft story, but they freely admit they don't have one qubit yet. So they're further behind. They may uh, catch up. There are quantum dots, which I had kind of written off 10 years ago, but they made tremendous progress in being able to convert the spin state to an electrical signal that they can read out. Uh, so they're making progress, but they're, they can do one qubit operations pretty well now, but they haven't done a two qubit gate yet. Thanks, Steve, again.